I hope we don't get tired of that song. As long as I get input to pick songs, that's going to be one of my favorites because that's why we're here, isn't it? We're not gathered here to hear my thoughts. If you are, get ready to be disappointed. We're here tonight to hear God speak. And what's exciting is God is not silent. Every single time we open the pages of God's word, God is speaking. The real question for us is whether or not we're ready to listen, whether or not we're ready to respond to God's voice. So tonight we're continuing what I started this morning, and I'm not making any promises that we'll get through it tonight because I get too excited on each one of these points, but I'll do my best. Of how we should be praying. God has a plan for us, not just how to live our lives and not just how to approach his word, but how to come to him in prayer. And if we're doing this on our own, coming, with, coming up with our own ideas, there's a strong likelihood that we're praying incorrectly. God cares about the way that you and I pray. You say, how much does he care? Enough to teach us how to pray so our heart's desire tonight should be echoing the, the heart's desire of that disciple that said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. It, again, requires humility of us, doesn't it? To acknowledge we need help in this area. You and I are not praying correctly. You've probably memorized it's something that you know, you've probably recited it many times, but I'm asking us tonight, as I did this morning, to look at it again with fresh eyes. Asking God to communicate what it is of each aspect of this model prayer that should impact the way that we pray. So this morning we talked about these first words, after this manner. These words are incredibly important because this sets the stage for how we are This is the pattern to follow. And this prayer that you and I pray every single time we come to God should be governed by relationship. God is our Father. Of all the ways that God could design how we relate to Him, He chose family relationship. God says He will be to us as a Father who has compassion on His children. And He wants us to relate to Him as a child who knows Our Father, which art in heaven, God is holy. He's set apart from us. His ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts than our thoughts. We should approach him boldly, but we should approach him reverently. He's in heaven. He deserves our respect. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our very first prayer request here is that God would be glorified. That should govern the way that we pray, not that we have our wants or Thy kingdom come. This is our second prayer request here of the Lord's Prayer. We should be praying as we go through our prayers each day to God, for his kingdom to come. Pray for God to rule and reign. And again, this can be another complicated question because you could easily ask this question just as the previous one. Well, can anyone diminish God's glory? Doesn't he already exist in all of his rightful glory? Yes. But is that always? No. And in the same way here, pray for God to rule and reign. Is God on his throne? Absolutely. God's over all. But is that always manifested here on earth? No. Is that always manifested in my life? No. And you say, well, you went from preaching to meddling just that fast. It's way easy for us to say, those sinners over there don't have God as their king. If we're going to be honest, are we living lives that acknowledge God as our king? Pray for God to rule and reign, and that starts with us. 
God, I want you to rule and reign in my life. Do you know why that's a struggle? Because we're constantly trying to replace God's rightful kingship with something else. With someone else. We want to be in charge, don't we? As I was witnessing to our little neighbor, as he came by me on Saturday, he's in a nation with saying, yes, I'm a Christian. And I said, tell me what that means. And he said, but I have God in my heart. I said, good, tell me what that means. He said, I don't know. <laughs> drew with chalk because our girls love to color with chalk on our driveway. I drew with chalk and I said, I wrote out heaven and I wrote out hell. And I said, if someone were to choose between heaven and hell, what would they pick? And he said, well, heaven. And I said, right. So then why is it that more people will be going to hell than going to heaven if everybody would want heaven? Because that's not the choice of salvation. Getting saved is not choosing between heaven and hell. Getting saved is choosing between your sin and the Savior. That's the choice. And the reason that more people end up in hell is because they don't want the Savior. They want their sin. And so I said to our little neighbor, which one are you choosing? And he said, well, I don't want sin. I want Jesus. And I said, okay, but what does your life look like? And I said, if, if I were to see the way that you talk to your mom and your dad, and I had a little bit of an inside scoop because he, his dad had already told me he'd been showing out and, and talking. And instantly he's shaking his head. He's just too honest, you know? He just owns it. And he said, no. He said, I'm choosing sin. And I said, that's the problem because Satan wants to convince us that somehow sin is better able to satisfy us than Jesus. And that's the pathway to destruction. Because until you turn from your sin into Jesus Christ, you have no assurance of salvation. And I said, so which path are you on right now? And he said, sin. Right. Satan's lie that somehow sin is better able to satisfy us than God is. I think it was that said our hearts are idol factors. They're constantly making idols that we want to supplant God's rightful first place with. So it's not enough just that you say, well, I prayed a prayer. It's not enough that we just have a lot of information. The question is, what choices am I making today? Am I living a life that demonstrates that God is my king? that God is my rightful authority. And when Olivia came to me and said that she wanted three yet, and I thought, how do you communicate the gospel effectively to someone without leaving out importance? And the way I explained it to her is this, Olivia, do you know that you've done wrong? She said, yes. Talk about that on a daily basis, right? So you need to ask Jesus Christ to take away your sins. But Olivia, you also have to ask Jesus to be your boss. That immediately met with the reaction. Oh, why? As Daniel said, that's all of our rebel hearts, isn't it? I want someone to, to take away my sins, but I don't want someone to tell me how to live. And even as Christians, we still struggle with that, don't we? Friends, if Jesus Christ is not your Lord, there's no assurance that he's your Savior. He's both. And the question for all of us is, is Jesus Christ in his rightful first place on our lives right now today? And that's what this prayer is about. Pray for God to rule and reign beginning with you. And this involves confession. When you're spending time with God in his word and going to him in prayer, it needs to start here. God, forgive me for not making you my rightful king today. reign in my life. This is what right kind of praying looks like. You say, that doesn't sound easy. It's not, but it's freeing. This is the only way that life works. Life doesn't work with you on the throne, and life won't work with sin on the throne. The only rightful first place in your heart and life is Jesus Christ. Pray for God to rule and reign in your life and then in the lives of others. Pray that others would see Jesus Christ for who he truly is, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and not just king over 
things king over us right now in our every decision. Every time we choose to sin, we're denying the rightful authority of Christ. Pray for God to rule and reign in your life and the lives of others. And our prayers should not seek to build our kingdom. If we're not careful, our prayer lives can start to look that way, can't they? God, here's my plan. God, here's my agenda. Here are all of my ambitions, and here's how I want you to work. Our prayer should not be seeking to build our kingdom. And our prayer should not revolve around earthly things. Of course, they'll include earthly things. But there's much more here that God wants us to be praying for. Our prayer shouldn't revolve around things. Earthly agendas, earthly ambitions, temporal things. Our prayer should be that we would advance God's kingdom. God, I want you to rule and reign in my life, and I want to be used to expand this to the lives of others. I want to be ambitious in this kingdom building of God. His is the kingdom that lasts forever. This world doesn't last anyways. So I invest in it. Invest in God's that lasts forever. And our prayer should be that we would be a part of that. God's plans. You realize that God has a plan? Sometimes I think with the way we pray, God, I know you haven't thought about this idea. God, here's what needs to happen. No, God has a plan. We need to submit to that plan. God's plan, God's authority, God's rule and reign. And this begins in our own personal life. Pray for God to be the king of your life today. Right now. I'm asking Camden that question. I'm thinking about myself. If others were to look at my life, what choices would they see me making? You say, well, I'm a Christian. Are, are we? Do our lives demonstrate that in a way that others would say, you're not the one in charge of your life. Jesus Christ is. And there's joyful submission there. That's different. Pray for God to be the evident king of your life. He has the rightful authority of the universe. Give him the rightful first place in your own life. Do some soul searching. God, is there anything in my life right now that I'm trying to withhold from you, that I'm unwilling to surrender to you? If so, that needs to be made right if our prayers are to be honoring to him. And make it your prayer that others would live this way as well. Our family members, our neighbors, those that we work with, pray and seek for ways to expand God's kingdom. What's next? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Does that sound familiar? Can you think of someone that prayed this way? Jesus Christ in the garden. One of the most difficult prayers he ever prayed. Why? Because he didn't want to be crucified? No. He understood what his crucifixion meant. For the first time, having a severance from the relationship with God the Father, Jesus Christ alone on the cross because of your sin and mine. He was willing to suffer and willing to die, and he chose to obey the Father's will, and that's why he prayed this way. God, here's my request, but your will be done. Jesus Christ gives us the example, doesn't he? This is what our prayer should look like. It's fine to make our requests and petitions known, but it should always be governed with this overarching principle. God, here's my desire, but I want your will mine. Because your way is best. That's how we should be praying. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Pray for God to do his will. That requires empty hands, doesn't it? And there are so many things that we can cling tightly to. God, I'll give you all of this, but I don't want to let go of that. And that thing that we're clinging to so tightly that we think brings us joy is the very thing that robs us of joy. Those things that we keep from God are keeping us from happiness. And there's one teen that I was counseling that said, I'm choosing sin right now because I have the same conversation with, with every person I counsel with. What's your choice right now? They say, I'm choosing sin right now. And this teen said, how do I know that God is better able to satisfy me than my sin? That's the question, isn't it? How do we know that God is better able to satisfy? And my question to this is always, well, who created joy? Did Satan? Satan invented happiness? 
Adam and Eve found it independently of God? No, it's Satan's lie that sin satisfies, that sin brings happiness. So don't hold on to this lie that somehow we have to choose sin to find happiness. This lie that somehow we're better able to make ourselves happy rather than God. It's not reality. True joy is found in open-handedness to God. God, you have all of me. I'm not holding anything back. God, I want you to do your will. And pray for what God wants more than what you want. Okay, here's my request, but God, I want you. I want your will to be done. Pray for that more. And pray that his will would be done. This is what's striking. Do you notice the last part of this phrase? Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. How is God's will done in heaven? With reluctancy, right? God communicates his desire and the angel. There's no resistance. There's joyful compliance. And that's the prayer here. God, I want your will to be done on earth in the same way that it's done in heaven, just as immediately and just as cheerfully. That includes us too. When God reveals his will to us, it's no more okay for us to say, fine, okay. In reluctancy, it's done in heaven. God has a will. Do we spend more time seeking his or trying to communicate ours? It's convicting, isn't it? Prayer is not conforming God's will to mine. Prayer is conforming my will to God's. I think so many times we say, okay, if I could just pray and get God to give me what I want. As the Israelites, where God gave them their request but sent leanness to their souls? No. Learn from that example. God, I want what you want because it's best, because you're good, because I trust you, because I love you. And submit to it just as joyfully and just as immediately as your will is responded to in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. What is this communicating? Yes, we can pray for God to meet our physical needs. It's fine. In fact, God commands us to do this, but it should be done in the proper order, shouldn't it? I think so often this is what leads our praying. This is what drives our praying. God, I need this, and I need this, and I need this. As if God doesn't know? Now, how should we be praying? Well, in right relationship, in right priority. God, I want you to be glorified. I want your will to be done. But we can come to him with our requests, with our needs. What are these physical needs? Food, clothing, finances, shelter. Yes, we can pray, and we should pray. We're not forbidden from asking for the things that we need. It's not wrong to pray for these physical needs. We should be praying for God's provisions. We should be praying for we should be praying for food and for clothing. Necessary things. But these should be in their proper place, their proper priority. Matthew 6, 25 through 33. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Now this might sound contradictory, but it's not. When he says, take no thought, that's not saying, well, forget about it. Don't even acknowledge it. No, what, what that's literally saying is, do not be anxious. We are allowed to pray for these things. We're not allowed to worry about these things. You want to talk about convicting? I needed this. So I'm studying through a passage. And people say, it was convicting. I'm like, well, good, because it's been stomping on my toes all week long. I come to a passage like this, and I say, God does not give us permission to worry. He gives us permission to pray. We're not allowed to worry. So as I'm looking at all of these unknowns, all the details that still have to be worked out about sorting out our move and all the crazy things that happen, and all the details that I have not figured out, what I can say is I can pray about it, but I'm not allowed to worry about it. God forbids it. 
I say unto you, take no thought. Don't be anxious for your life, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat or the body than raiment? God says, yes, pray about them, but don't worry about them because life consists of more than just these physical things. And he goes on, verse 26, behold the fowls of the air. Look at the birds. They don't plant. They sow not. Neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Amen. God cares for them. The birds are not losing one minute of a night's sleep. And they're not even planting. They're not even reaping. Why? God is providing for them. And so when I'm looking at all these birds, and we've been discovering, Lisa's been doing a lot of bird watching with our girls as part of their homeschooling, and we're seeing all these nests that they're making. I've never been aware of them before. I, it never crossed my mind. But as you're starting to acknowledge just how much life there is around us, just even in these birds, and you realize God cares for every single one of them, won't he care for us? Can't we trust him to care for us? And he says this, are ye not much better than they? Those birds aren't going hungry. And don't we matter more? Of course we do. So pray, yes, but worry, no. And he says this of worry. Which one of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? Look, your worry doesn't change one thing. Worrying about your height won't make you taller. Worry doesn't fix anything. You can't add to your height just by worrying. And why are you worrying about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field. Look at these beautiful flowers, how they grow. They don't work. They don't spin. They're not making their own clothes. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The richest man that ever lived wasn't as beautiful as these flowers. And who clothed them? God. So why are we worried? He feeds the birds. He clothes the flowers. He'll take care of us. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. Look, if God spends so much time decorating these flowers that are short-lived, look how quickly those daffodils wilted that were by our door. Right? They won't last that long. If God makes those things as beautiful as they are for as short-lived as they are, shall he not much more clothe you? And then look what he says here. He had to throw this in. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, me. I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to have all the answers. Why? I know the one who does. God's good. Won't he clothe you? Oh, ye of little faith. Therefore, Take no thought. Remember what this is saying. It's not stop thinking about it. It's stop worrying about it. Therefore, take no thought saying, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. have no reason to fear. We have no excuse to worry. This is not for us. All of these things do the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. When we come to God with our petitions, don't act like you're telling him something he doesn't know. God, just so you know, I'm not sure how we're going to make it financially. God, just so you know, our pantry's looking bare. God, just so you know, he says, I know. Will you trust? Will you be one of little faith? Will you be one like the Gentiles who's living according to fear? No, we have a God who takes care of everything. He'll take care of us. He knows that we have need of all these things. And what does he say here? Seek first the kingdom of God. Yes, we can ask for these earthly things, but that's not priority number one. What's priority number one? Seeking God. Make him first. Seek his righteousness. And then what does he
when I'm tempted to be anxious and to worry, what should I do? Go back to trusting my heavenly father and focus on seeking him. Staying close to the shepherd, that's my job. It's not my job to read the mind of the shepherd. It's not my job to advise. My job to follow the shepherd, to stay close to the shepherd. All I am is a sheep. And you say, that's offensive. Yes, maybe, because they're not known for their smarts. But it's freeing. God's not relying on my intellect. He's not relying on your. What do we do next? God's saying, just follow me. I'm the shepherd. Yes, I'm sorry for forgetting that. What's my job? Stay close to the shepherd. Seek him and his righteousness and everything else God promises to take care of. And guess what? He's better able to take care of it than I am. He's better able to take care of it than you are. And that is freeing. I will gladly be a dumb sheep because the worry is not mine. The responsibility is not mine. My responsibility is to stay close to the shepherd. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. You say, good, because I've got a lot of them. My credit card bill is just piling up. It's not what he's saying here. Forgive us our debts. As you pray, pray for God's forgiveness. Pray for God's forgiveness. Acknowledge where you've transgressed his law. As I was speaking with my neighbor, he was asking me all these questions as we were talking about heaven and hell. What I loved is that he starts to ask all the important questions. And we were just talking about salvation. And then he volunteers and says, I need to stop listening to wrong music. And I said, what? We hadn't, I'm not preaching standards to him. I'm preaching Christ to him. And God's doing the work in his heart. God's convicting him of sin. I'm not talking about those things. When you get right with God, he starts to put his finger on things in your life, doesn't he? It's uncomfortable. Yes. So what do we do when he puts his finger on those things in our life? Give them over to him. And my little neighbor said, I'm going to stop listening to that. I just said, okay. <laughs> That's not salvation. You're not saved by doing. But God's not content to leave us in our sin. He's saving us from our sin. And my neighbor was understanding that already. So he starts to say, well, is it sin if I do this? Is it sin if I do that? Is it sin if I, okay, let's talk about what sin is. Sin is anything I think, say, or do that breaks God's law. So you want to know that? Get to know God's word. I don't want him coming to me. Can I do this? Can I do that? Don't ask me. Talk to God. Listen to God. Hold your life up to the standard of God's word. And where it doesn't measure up, make it right. And our prayer lives should always reflect this. We should be constantly confessing to God. Because we're constantly transgressing the law, aren't we? There's so many areas that we fall short. Pray for God to forgive you. Our daily prayers must include regular confession. And the person that says they're not praying is the person that's not confessing. And the person that says that they're not confessing is the person that's not correctly praying. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, what? The Lord won't hear me. If I'm not confessing, my prayers aren't effective. Our daily prayers must include regular confession. Keep short sin accounts with God. As soon as you commit that sin, don't say, well, I'm too embarrassed to ask for forgiveness. It's worse to hold on to it. It's worse to be so stubborn that you don't turn from it. God knows you committed it. Get it right with him right away. Don't let that go on. Keep short sin accounts with God. You say, well, how often should I pray for forgiveness? As often as you fail the grace of God. You say, but I failed five times today and I've already asked him four times to forgive me. Ask him again. Keep short sin accounts with God. The only sin that God doesn't forgive is the sin that you have not confessed. If we confess our sins, and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from most unrighteousness. No, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Nobody corrected me. It's terrifying. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If there's sin in your life, it's not because God hasn't been willing to forgive it. It's because you haven't been willing to confess it. So won't you confess it? Don't hold on to it. As often as you fail the grace of God, how often should you pray? Well, how often do you sin? Then pray for forgiveness just that many times. And how soon should you pray for forgiveness? Immediately. Right away. Don't hold on to it. Remember what we studied through Hebrews. 
It's that deceitfulness of sin that hardens our hearts. Don't let that take root because Satan's goal for you is not just for you to have a pet sin. It's for that sin to control you and for that sin to destroy you. And how do you protect yourself from being destroyed by sin? Confess it and forsake it and finding mercy. So if we're going to be praying effectively, we must be confessing. Pray for God to forgive you. I jumped the gun. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This confessing should be a regular part of our prayer lives. And I know I have a clock too. We're not going to get through all of this tonight. As we forgive our debtors is where we'll pick up next time. And this is important for us. All of these are important for us. So where do we stop tonight? How do we draw application from what we've already talked about? Well, just going from what we've looked at tonight. Are we praying for God's kingdom to come? Or are we in our personal lives trying to somehow establish our own kingdom? Are we living lives that pretend like we're on the throne? Even as Christ God's better at being king, and his is the kingdom that lasts forever. Make him rightful first place in your life. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Are you praying for God's will more than yours? And are you following God's will with that cheerful, immediate obedience? Again, if I tell my daughters to obey and they obey with a bad attitude, that's not obedience. And it's no different when we respond to God that way. God doesn't want reluctant obedience. He wants cheerful, joyful, immediate obedience. And that's what he's worthy of. Are we living that? God, I'll do it. God's not impressed with that. God, I want to do your will. I delight in doing your will. That's what God wants from us. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Are we asking for God to meet our needs in faith? without worry, knowing that he knows our needs better than we do ourselves and trusting him to meet them his way, not ours. Worry has no place in the life of the believer. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Are we confessing our sins? Are there things in your life right now that you've not yielded to God? If so, stop praying about everything else and start there. God, forgive me for this. And as God places his finger on different areas of your life, give every single one to him. Come to God with empty hands. God, I want your will. And God, there's nothing off limits. Touch anything you want. Everything's yours. That's where happiness comes from. And that's where powerful praying begins. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for being our Father. And I thank you that we can know you in this personal family kind of way. I thank you that you claim us as your children. And I pray that we would relate to you as our father. God, I pray that in each of these areas that you've spoken to us tonight from your word, that we would respond in obedience. Forgive us for our rebel hearts. Forgive us for seeking to establish our own kingdoms. Forgive us for trying to follow the pursuits of our own wills. Lord, forgive us for worrying about physical things instead of trusting you to provide. And Heavenly Father, please forgive us for holding on to sins that you want us to confess and forsake. Lord, I pray that if there would be one tonight that's wrestling with this issue, with any of these issues, that even tonight we would respond to your word in obedience obedience that pleases you. And I pray that we would learn to live lives of this kind of praying that see your kind of powerful answering. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.